Firenze at the Università degli Studi di Parma. Ah, thanks. Uh, I want uh, to use many superlatives that Professor Galese deserves as one of the leading figures in the field of uh, neuroesthetics among other people. So I won't take the time you take the podium and we will have hopefully time for discussion. We want to keep the issue of interaction and discussion as much as we can. So Professor Galese, thank you so much. Uh, uh, good morning everybody. I'm I'm really happy to be here and I'm mostly grateful to Hava because uh, this is my very first time in Israel and my very first time in Jerusalem. And it's nice to be for the first time in a country when you are hosted by a good friend like Hava is. Um, my job today, supposedly, is to tell you something, how possibly neuroscience could uh, have something to say uh, on this uh, incredibly complex uh, uh, a topic uh, of aesthetics. Uh, but first of all, I would like to frame my approach uh, slightly and, and because uh, um, cognitive neuroscience, if we confine ourselves to neuroscience, is a huge field. Uh, uh, I can barely understand the meaning of the title of many papers published in uh, our uh, journal recently because. Uh, I don't know anything about molecular biology, and sometimes uh, uh, a couple of days ago, my, my daughter uh, browsed on my desk, and she was reading a, a title, and I said, well, what is this article about? She's almost 10, and I said, I have no idea. <laughs> so if we confine ourselves to cognitive neuroscience, which is a, the territory I know uh, a little more, uh, I would put it in this way. It's a methodological approach. It's a methodological approach that can uh, lead you to ask a variety of questions. These questions can be very different. You can think of the brain as a sort of magical uh, algorithmic box, uh, completely divorced from the body. So your job is to decode the algorithm and possibly to reproduce it on a non-biological device. And the European community uh, uh, put a lot of money on this bet recently, 10 billion uh, euros, uh, uh, um, on the bet that in 10 years we will be able to reproduce a substantial part of the human mind uh, on a, a non-biological device like a computer. I wish them uh, good luck, but uh, <laughs> let me be a little skeptical about the possibility to create a mind without a body. So this picture is uh, meant uh, uh, to express the feeling that, uh, uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense to think about the brain if we don't consider the brain tightly wired with the body. So I like to speak of the brain-body system uh, in walking along the path that uh, Ludovica was sketching before when, when she said, where's the brain? The brain is the nervous system. I would add the body to the picture. So looking for the body in the brain means specifically uh, with a methodological uh, uh, reductionist approach trying to deconstruct some of the concepts that we normally use uh, uh, when we speak about ourselves, about our life, about experience, uh, about art possibly, about aesthetic experience, and trying to see what these concepts uh, are made of. So and I think uh, we can't leave the body out of the picture in order to make sense of uh, how we develop those concepts and what those concepts really mean. So my, uh, I, I want to start by paying a tribute to Samir. Uh, Samir uh, was a forerunner in this field. In 90, 1992, from 92 to 94, I was working in Tokyo with Hideo Sakata. Uh, a Japanese uh, former pupil of Vernon Newcastle. We were studying how the parietal uh, cortex translates the three-dimensional shape of an object into the motor program required to uh, manipulate the object. Uh, uh, he was a very good friend of Samir, and uh, occasionally, uh, when we had dinner very late uh, at night, uh, after a long day in the lab, uh, he was bringing up 
the notion of uh, volumetric primitives, uh, and after talking uh, to Samir, he was relating this uh, typically neuroscientific uh, topic uh, and uh, finding a bridge with the use of volumes in Cezanne. So to say that Samir was thinking about the possibility to bridge the two fields a long time ago. Uh, so without Samir, probably we wouldn't be here. Okay. But as I said, uh, uh, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience is a, a methodological approach. So the questions being addressed by Samir uh, do not necessarily overlap with the question I'm trying to address now. And what I'm trying to do is to use cognitive neuroscience to study the functional relation between the brain-body system and aesthetic experience. So I'm not so much concerned with beauty, uh, with art, creativity. I, I, I want to better understand what's going on when I'm facing an image in the first place. And possibly later on, uh, what uh, I'm experiencing when this image has peculiar features that uh, uh, make us uh, uh, call it uh, an art. So in a way, as I said, in this uh, uh, deconstruction enterprise, neuroscience can be used as a sort of cognitive archaeology, uh, namely to see uh, 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 what these concepts we, we are normally using, as I said before, are made of. But there's a further uh, uh, issue here that led me to explore uh, this uh, very uh, perilous uh, territory, namely the fact that by means of aesthetic experience, uh, uh, we, uh, um, in a way, have the possibility to uh, live in one of the many possible worlds we uh, constantly inhabit. So understanding what aesthetic experience is made of uh, is crucial uh, to have uh, a better picture of how our brain-body system enable us uh, uh, to live in a variety of worlds. Some of these worlds we call them real, some we call them fictional. Uh, my gut feeling is that uh, we are not dealing with uh, uh, categorical issues here, but we move along a continuum. And the more I study the brain, the more I realize that uh, the relationship between what I do and what I imagine to do is not as sharp as language uh, uh, may uh, uh, lead us to think. Our body represents subjectivity by enacting it in a series of postures, feelings, behaviors, affects. We're going to learn more about affect from Mark. Uh, while at the same time, by projecting itself into the world, dramatizes the world, transforms the world into the stage in which corporeality is at the same time protagonist and spectator lived and recognized. We must start from this constitutive relation between body and symbolic expression if we wish to investigate from a biological perspective the issue of artistic creativity and its reception. So I wouldn't even dare to speak of art because the notion of art is so much uh, uh, historically determined. I don't think that the people who painted uh, the beautiful animals in uh, uh, Chauvet Cave, uh, we could call them artists. They were probably shamans or we'll never know. So, but those paintings are uh, the expression of something which, as far as we understand, uniquely human. The possibility to create the urge to create symbols. So the relationship between symbol making and symbol reception and the brain body system is the main thrust of, of my research, the main reason why I'm here. OK. You recognize this shark, this famous shark, very expensive shark. And this is a quote from an Italian philosopher, very inspired by phenomenology, Dino Formaggio, in 1981. Art is everything humans call art. There's one, one word missing from this life. So that's why I, I, I prefer more to speak of symbol than, than art. So perhaps instead of art, we should speak of symbolic creation and expression. And uh, we recently published this paper. I'd like to start from this. Uh, it's an EEG study. So basically, we were measuring uh, 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 alpha band 
desynchronization and resynchronization. When you move, uh, uh, the alpha rhythm gets desynchronized uh, on top of the motor strip. And it turns out to be desynchronized also when you see someone uh, performing an action or a movement. So in a way, it's an indirect way of testing mirror, mirror mechanism. Uh, we didn't show actions. We show static graphic signs. Uh, we <coughs> yes. Roman alphabet letters, Chinese ideograms, and scribbles. And we tried as much as possible to match the number of strokes uh, to keep the uh, gestaltic complexity of the stimuli constant. Although people were looking at uh, symbolic graphic signs uh, and uh, meaningless graphic signs. No particular instruction, but look carefully at the computer screen and try not to blink as much as you can, because when you blink, you introduce bloody noise uh, into the signal. And the result uh, was uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, we were able to uh, measure alpha desynchronization. So in other words, we were able to spot an activation of the motor system of, of the viewers uh, lateralized to uh, the left hemisphere. Participants were all right-handed. And what uh, we thought it was uh, also interesting is the fact that in spite of the fact that all graphic stimuli were able to induce a, an activation, I would call it a motor simulation in the brain of observer, there were significant differences between the symbols and the scribbles. So the symbols, the ideograms and the alphabet letters uh, uh, produced a stronger desynchronization which was lasting longer uh, with respect uh, uh, to the scribbles. And of course, you can explain very easily uh, this difference, perhaps in terms of visual familiarity. Even if people were Italian native speakers, um, nobody uh, was able to understand the meaning of the Chinese ideogram. Uh, if you live in Italy now, you see Chinese uh, uh, signs everywhere, because there are more and more Chinese people opening restaurants, shops, bars. So they could immediately recognize from that iconic symbol that it's part of the language that you don't understand. A more exciting alternative uh, hypothesis would be that uh, mi linguistic meaningful symbols share some uh, uh, kinematic uh, primitives uh, that are uh, immediately recognized by your motor system while scribbles don't, because uh, every scribble is different from, from another one. While, I mean, that's the hypothesis I, I would like to be true, but uh, our data uh, do not allow it uh, to disambiguate, uh, and I don't know enough about people who uh, eventually investigated comparatively all forms of writing if there was someone coming up with the idea that there must be some, some uh, kinematic uh, 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 limitation that uh, uh, some, somehow forced people to invent writing uh, within uh, a limited set of uh, motor possibilities. But I, I don't know anything. So I, will, uh, I will stop here. So we have the first evidence that uh, when you contemplate something that has been produced by uh, uh, a human hand movement that induces uh, an activation in the hand representation of the motor system of the viewer. So if you want to extract some uh, more far-reaching uh, 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 statement from this uh, a preliminary result, we could say that the symbolization process, in spite of its articulation as a progressive abstraction and externalization from the body, keeps its bodily ties intact, not only because the body is the instrument of symbols production, but also because it is the main instrument of their reception. So the third element that drove me into this field is the fact that since the discovery of mirror neurons, we moved uh, from the topic of how the brain body represents space, how the brain body guides our movement towards manipulable object, 
we move into the domain of interpersonal relations, of intersubjectivity. So there is an additional element of interest for someone like me uh, to study aesthetic experience, and specifically this, that uh, aesthetic experience is a form, if you can put it in that way, is a form of mediated intersubjectivity. You have two human beings, the artist who's not present, not necessarily present, unless we deal with performing art. But let's think about, uh, 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 not about contemporary art, but classic art. So you have an artist who produces something, you have the artwork, and you have the bystander, the, the beholder. So by relating to that particular object simultaneously, you relate to another human being. So that's an additional uh, element of interest for someone interested in uh, uh, unraveling uh, 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 the nuts and bolts of intersubjectivity, so to speak. So let me quickly jump to mirror neurons. Um, we discovered them by, by chance. We weren't looking for uh, mirror neurons. This is a very strong element that people in Europe uh, do not understand. Every time you write a grant more and more, you must promise something exceptional that you will build a machine that will, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, will uh, enable uh, people to awake from death or something like that. <laughs> Otherwise, not enough challenging and uh, uh, sexy uh, uh, to, to be worth being funded. But uh, uh, this is one of the many examples that uh, 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 with basic research, you know where you start, but you don't know. You never know where you will end up. Uh, um, so we were exploring uh, neurons translating the three-dimensional shape of an object into a motor program suitable to, to deal with those objects. And we realized that uh, some of the neurons were not firing when we were showing the object to the macaque, but beforehand when we were grasping the object in order to show it uh, to the macaque. So in other words, neurons that fire when the action is being performed, in this case by the monkey, but also when the same action is uh, witnessed by the monkey being performed by someone else. And uh, this uh, view, or lateral view of the uh, human brain shows you in colors the part of our brain that turned out to be activated both by action execution and uh, action observation. And the motor palette uh, in our brain is much bigger than in the macaque. Uh, in the macaque, as far as we understand, only goal-related motor acts are uh, uh, efficient in evoking this mechanism. If you pantomime uh, uh, the grasping of something but the object isn't there, most of the neuron will not fire. And if you do apparently meaningless movement, like raising your arm, Again, mirror neurons in the macaque monkey brain will not fire while they do activate in our brain. And this much bigger uh, mimetic palette is perhaps one part of the explanation uh, on why we are indeed uh, the true mimetic species, in spite of the fact that we, we say to ape someone, but apes are not very good at aping. We are the best. So basically, we have uh, a substantial part of the dorsal and ventral premotor cortex and of the posterior parietal lobe that is activated both during the execution and observation of object-directed action, communicative actions, and body movements, like dancing. Dance has been uh, extensively explored by colleagues, particularly in London, by Calvo Merino, Patrick Hager, because they wanted to study the role of motor experience in modulating this type of response. Mirroring is just a method. A mirror is forced for all its entire life to reflect specifically what you put in front of it. If you put an apple in front of a mirror, you will never see a, a, a peach being reflected. While in our case, things get more complicated. So we are metabolizing mirrors, so to speak. And in other words, to translate it in more scientific terms, my motor experience uh, heavily influences uh, the way this mechanism is driven. So the more I'm familiar from a motor point of view with what I see, the more this mechanism kicks in uh, with the higher intensity. So if you're a classic ballet dancer, 
your mirroring mechanism is more heavily active than when you see uh, uh, a capoeira dancer, uh, which is taken from an experiment by uh, Calvo Marino and, and the other way around. Very early on, I thought, together with Alvin Goldman, and we, we, we wrote together a short article in 2000, uh, with the feeling that what had been discovered uh, back then, so far, uh, could have been just the tip of a much bigger iceberg. Namely, that mirroring could not necessarily be confined exclusively to the domain of action, but could uh, uh, be the expression of a more basic uh, uh, mechanism uh, of the brain-body system, and therefore it could be spotted uh, eventually in other domains, like in the domains of emotion and sensation. I use this word domain, being fully uh, aware that is, this is one of the many outcomes of our methodological uh, reductionism. Uh, we have a holistic uh, uh, phenomenal experience uh, of the other, so we don't perceive the action, we perceive the emotion or the sensation, and that somehow these uh, unimodal experiences are fused together or associated together. The action comes along with this emotional content uh, simultaneously. So, as Ludovica was saying uh, uh, in her introduction, uh, we are oversimplifying things because things are too complex. Uh, and so we want to study action alone, emotion alone, and sensation alone uh, to make our life somehow easier. Uh, but being fully aware that in order to reconstruct the mosaic, uh, you have to, but slowly, in, with incremental step, uh, uh, the, the, the goal is to go back to the complexity by adding one ingredient at a time, uh, which we didn't at the beginning. But at the beginning, we were the first to show that mirroring could be applied to one emotion like disgust. This is what you see on the left side of the slide. This is a parasagittal view of the human brain. This part of the brain is called the insula. And it, its anterior part, we were able to demonstrate that this part of the insula activates both when you feel subjective disgust, but also when you see the face of someone else showing disgust. And on the right, you see uh, another part of our brain, the second somatosensory area, and we were able to show that this, uh, back then considered to be merely a, a tactile area, can be activated not only when your body is touched, but also when you see an equivalent body part of someone else being touched. So you have mirroring uh, in the visceromotor and in the haptic or tactile domain as well. And this is a recent uh, meta-analysis uh, summarizing 125 fMRI experiments uh, specifically targeting the issue of uh, the mirror mechanism, showing that not only uh, parietal premotor areas are active uh, during action observation and execution, but other parts of our brain uh, show this similar way of double way of activation when you perceive something or when you experience something. So, the mirror mechanism maps the sensory representation of the action, emotion, or sensation of another onto the perceiver own motor, visceral motor, or somatosensory body deformated representation of that action, emotion, or sensation. And the idea is that this mapping enables one to perceive the action, emotion, or sensation of another as if she were performing that action or experiencing that emotion or sensation herself. I have no time here to explain how our brain-body system is implicitly able to disengage the agent from the observer, the experiencer from, from the witness. Uh, the mirror mechanics show different intensity of activation, even in monkeys when they act with respect to when they see someone else acting. So there's probably no necessity to imply a who system in charge of this ambiguity. The system in itself is transparent to the uh, a notion of agency. And following as a development of my collaboration with Alvin Goldman, that uh, uh, is uh, one of the main proposers of simulation theory of mind reading, I found that I had to add the adjective embodied 
uh, uh, to make sense of all this evidence that I very briefly and concisely uh, reviewed so far. So I tried to provide with this functional description a unitary account of basic aspects of social cognition, showing that people use their own mental state or processes represented in a non-linguistic but bodily format in functionally attributing them to others. And now let me quickly move uh, to uh, a perilous exercise, namely uh, experimental aesthetics and neuroscience. Uh, so the hypothesis is that embodied simulation generates the peculiar quality of the embodied thing as that plays a significant role in aesthetic experience. Of course, uh, aesthetic experience uh, is a multi-layered uh, uh, entity. So when we enter spaces like this, Museo dell'Accademia in Florence, you already frame everything because you are in a museum. You are in a very specific mental attitude. You see an object that uh, has been taught to you to be a masterwork of Western art. So you're not just facing a, a neutral object. Uh, and uh, experience something like uh, well, when I look at this device here. So your perception is already framed by history, by background, by your own personal identity. So in other words, there is a huge so 